Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hillsong Church. We've had an amazing weekend at Color Conference with the girls. We're gonna start, out with, start off with something a little bit different this morning. Teach me how to love you. Show me how to trust you more than with my words or with a song. No, it's not been easy to live life down on my knees, but with faith I know I carry on.
But wasn't that amazing, church? Come on, would you give them a hand? That was incredible. But we've had we've had two incredible Color Your World conferences in the last couple of weeks. But don't worry if you missed out on Color Congress, you did not miss out. Because the same presence of God that was there ministering to all those women in our city is here this morning. Do you have faith for that? Oh, I do believe my microphone is not working. Do you have faith for that today, church? You see, time moves in rhythm with His aim. Moment by moment, beat by beat. Rolling to death, both kick and snare. No rebel beat that skips his feet And it might sound like Who on earth said song should be tame Then now the music chases his heart Mercy by mercy no The pitch he moved the score. How we would notice we'd resolve. And it might sound wild. Wild is where my heart sings. Oh, Sing his praise to the other side. Cause I hope.
your voice front to back. Oh. I don't think we're finished with this quite yet. Because I can see people in the back that are thinking that we are. We're going to pedestrian church, but this isn't pedestrian church. This is praise the Lord church. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, lift your life. It says, cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. This morning's like these. When we come into church, we need to lay hold of that. That we can come to God. We can cast our cares. We can cast our burdens. We can cast our worries upon Him. He will sustain us through our tribulation. He'll sustain us through our trial. And He'll never let the righteous be shaken. Amen. Do you have faith for that this morning? Amen. Oh 
still am a stream free.
welcome to church this morning. It's great to have you in the house after Colour Conference, which has been amazing. And uh, we are blessed this morning because we have Lisa Harper, who's going to be speaking to us again. And we're excited about that. But right now, Pastor Brian is going to drop in and say hello to us across the link. Father, we're so grateful to be in your house today. And Lord, I just thank you for every person taking time out to be in church this morning. What a beautiful name you have. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name is your name, the name of Jesus, the name that's above every other name. Lord, we're grateful. Have your way, I pray, in church all the way across the day. And Lord, not only here in our church, but in your church all around the world. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And a faithful people said together, Amen. Said together, Amen. <laughs> uh, how good to be in the city today. So, good morning. Good morning, all. And uh, big hi to Hills and Brisbane Central and every other place we gather, Southwest, wherever you guys are. And uh, what a great colour conference, huh? All the women who went to one of the two colour conferences, give us a wave. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your commitment and support and uh, praise God for the conference. So many great stories already coming out of Colour Conference and huge thank you to all the people who helped and volunteered and did whatever you could do. Amazing rally. It's great in here. It's great. Look, I'm used to being out there at Hills where Grant Thompson is, you know, compared with you guys, a bit stodgy out there. Look at you guys. <laughs> Uh, you know what? We're going to have an incredible night tonight in church. It's our Revival Prophecy Night. How great is that? We're going to just really believe God that there's something incredible in our evening service. So whatever you do, don't miss tonight. All evening services, Revival Prophecy Night. And I hope you guys will come and wear a really bright shirt. Wear, wear a really bright shirt. It's a, it's a prophecy shirt, all right? So wear something luminous, you know, something bright yellow, bright pink, bright purple. You never know. It might work. <laughs> nah, we are going to have a great night. So I'm kidding, obviously, about that, but we are going to have a great night. And I really hope you guys will keep leaning in to our revival nights. Praise God for all that's happening. Hello, Chelsea. Everything that's happening here in the city. And uh, the good news is, the best news is, the best is yet to come. Yeah. Amen. Come on, let's sing one more time. Oh, how good is it here from Pastor Brian? We love Pastor Brian and Bobby. Yeah. We are blessed. Well, some people have taken some time to fill out some praise reports and someone here is thanking God for an amazing colour conference and why wouldn't you? Uh, someone's thanking God their hand is healed. Someone's thanking God they got a permanent Australian residency and a great job. Uh, that's pretty cool. I, uh, I walked out of the 8am service and I said hello to um, a, a young father carrying a little baby and he's holding this little tiny baby in his arms and her name was Eloise and she was asleep and he tells me she's a colour baby. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, this time last year we couldn't have a baby and Bobby prayed over a whole bunch of us and colour this year he's holding his brand new baby and I think that's an awesome miracle. That's one of many that Bobby's been praying but I think it's pretty awesome. Someone else is thanking God for healing in their right hand. Someone's thanking God for a new job. Someone's thanking God for His faithfulness. Someone's thanking God for the rain in Darwin. That's pretty awesome. And uh, so many good things. But we're going to believe God. People have taken some time to fill out the red forms and their, the prayer request forms. And so we're going to be believing someone's praying for the salvation for their husband. Someone needs healing from cancer. Someone needs freedom. I read about a court case here that someone needs God to intervene in. Someone is believing for a friend's salvation. We're going to be believing for all those and everything that's written down here. And then the blue forms are forms that people have taken the time out to write down and believe for God to save their family and friends. It's a prayer of faith. So we're going to be believing for all these. So if you would, could you stretch out your hand if you feel comfortable? It's just an expression of your faith and begin to pray out loud in your own words. If you do, speak in the language of the Spirit, but let's not be afraid of our own voices and let's pray with a fervency. The Bible says that the fervent prayer moves God. And so Lord, we believe in Jesus' Name that You will have Your way. We thank You for the Name of Jesus. We thank You for the promise of God. We thank You for Your goodness and Your kindness and Your 
grace, Lord. We can't deserve it. We don't earn it, but we come to You, Lord, and believe for healing, miracles, salvations. We believe You will have Your way. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing, Jad. church. How are you all? Hey, give someone a high five, a hug, a kiss, whatever you like this morning. And you may be seated. Let me encourage you around our giving this morning. My name's Lee Burns. I'm the, well, I'm the Executive Vice President of Hillsong College. How's that? How's that? And uh, one of the pastors here of church. And so I'm going to uh, encourage you around your giving. Those of you online this morning, you're welcome to participate in this uh, area of worship as well. And uh, for those of you giving, those of you from Hillsong Church, you'll know you can use one of the ways here behind me. I use the giving app. I find that easy. And so, uh, so I gave on Friday. But let me, let me read out a scripture. I'll explain it, then illustrate it. The, Paul talks to the Philippian church in chapter 4, having just received an offering from them. And he says this about the offering. He says that, that it's a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Then he puts in this little reminder before he finishes. He says in verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. Basically what the Apostle Paul is doing here is reminding the Philippian church that yes, you have given, but don't forget where the source of your giving comes from, where the source of blessing comes from. And I learned this early as a new Christian when I came to Bible college. And in 1998, I remember I had $20 to get me through the week. And I had it in my pocket and a student came up to me and was telling me about the week that they had and that they'll probably have to finish up college because they can't afford their fees. And I felt the Lord tell him to give me give him the $20 and I'm having that argument with, well, then what have I got left? And, and, you know, I was basically, okay, well, I'll fast for seven days. And so I pulled the $20 out of my pocket. I said, here, take this. And at first he said, no, I can't do that. And I said, bro, go for it. There's plenty more where that came from. (laughs) Thinking it's not in my bank account. It's not in my pocket. It's a supernatural source. But this guy thought that I had a what of 20 somewhere. And so we ended up taking the $20. Well, by the end of the day, I was in class and a student came up to me and said, hey, I really feel like the Lord 
told me to give you this and they reached into their pocket and pulled out $20. Now in my head, I'm thinking, Lord, I'm a hundredfold believer. Isn't it meant to be $2,000? And I really felt the Lord say this, there's plenty more where that came from. He supplies all our daily need according to His riches and glory, amen? Amen. So hold your offering in your hand this morning and let me pray over it. Father, we thank You for the honour it is always to sow into the Kingdom. Father, I pray that You'll take what we sow this morning and see Your Kingdom established and extended here on earth. Father, I pray that You continue to meet our need according to Your riches and glory. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Amen. Host, you may pass the containers as they do that. Check out the screens, find out everything that's coming up. Oh, hi. Firstly, so glad you're in church and your being here makes a big, big difference. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. We thank God for the people who attend our services and people come expectant. And I want to encourage people to understand that coming early, coming on time, taking time to have our kids in the program and being in our place early really makes a huge difference to the services and the atmosphere. And also staying till the end. If you can stay, you make a massive difference. And we're trying to build the kind of culture in our church where anything could happen. And I encourage you to just stay right through to the last prayer and then you're welcome to head out straight away. It makes a big difference and I know you can help us to take the church forward. I want you to lean in and be filled with faith, all right? I want you to really have an expectation. We're gonna believe that the gift of prophecy will be an operation. Amen. Everybody say irresistible. Amen. That is the Kingdom of God in these days. The irresistible, beautiful Kingdom of God, the house of God, what God is doing on the earth. Good morning. Are you good? Are you alive? Are you well? Are you vibing for Jesus? (laughs) Amen. Good morning. I am like so happy to be here. 
amongst my family. And you know what? Obviously, you should have seen that on the big screens down in the ICC downtown. Spectacular. And um, I just want to say thank you, church. I know Brian gave expression, but I want to say thank you so much for being the remarkable church that you are, allowing us to host an event that I believe, and I say this with humility of heart, has blessed the body of Christ and has changed lives forever. I believe miracles have been set in motion and it's going to be felt and heard in the days that are ahead. Amen. So as a praise report, amen, a praise report before the Lord, there were over 17, almost 17 and a half thousand involved in colour this year, which is testimony that Sydney alone. Amen. There were 42 nations represented. There were 21 denominations represented, which actually speaks of the beautiful diversity and unity across the body of Christ. Exciting. Here's the best news. In a three-day conference that is closed, a paying conference actually, like a conference, there were over 1,300 decisions for Christ. Amen, isn't that awesome? Which basically means that people are confident to labour and compel and bring friends who don't yet know the Lord. And it was awesome. So thank you again, it was incredible. And of course, 2020 is on the horizon as always. And it's gonna be wild and bright and there's gonna be no end of awakening in Jesus' Name. So here is the deal with that. There is an official, beautiful invitation to you on the seats for all the women, okay? If you didn't receive this at Colour, take this, it's yours. I want you to open it, read it, think, my gosh, who can, can I be there next year? Or can I give this to someone? Can I entrust it to someone? It's gorgeous. But I don't know if you've noticed, we have um, amazing guests coming and Voskamp who is a renowned author and speaker and woman of God, justice advocate. We have Leanne Matias from um, California who has just dropped dead gorgeous. You're gonna fall in love with her. But next year we are downtown in the ICC, that beautiful venue that seats 8,000. And then we are here the second week, which in essence means we turn this place into something quite magical and wonderful. But it means that we are 4,000 seats less at conference next year. So I wanna encourage you not to dilly-dally, as I say. Amen, if you know you're gonna be there and you're gonna be friends, you need to get in, okay? Is that awesome? How good is God? He's so good. You're a beautiful church. Thank you so much for all you do. We are so blessed this morning because Lisa Harper is here, as Grant said. And uh, she has been preaching her heart out downtown and She is, let me just like brag on you. You are, no, come, don't get shy. (laughs) Don't hide. (laughs) We can see you, we can still see you. (laughs) But you are magnificent. You're a beautiful woman of God. You're a beautiful mum. You're a great friend. You're a loyal follower of Christ. Yes, I'm gonna make you cry. (laughs) And we love you because you're actually family. So thank you for being here. Thank you, and also, Thank you for like being up so early this morning. You've done, this is your third service this morning. And we're excited for what is in you. Amen. Put your hands together for Lisa. Yay! Amen. I I truly, it is, please, please sit down. Um, And those of y'all who were not at color, all you testosterone representatives, (laughs) I need to apologize to you because I am a spitter. And so this is like baptism row. Um, But I can't even tell you what an honor and a joy it is to be with you. Huge privilege. I deeply, deeply, deeply respect Pastor Brian, Pastor Bobby, y'all's ministry. Of course, now you're a global church. But back when you were just in eyes, the echoes of what Jesus uh, did here made their way to Nashville, Tennessee, and I have been kind of a product of your ministry, even though I live in Nashville where there is not yet a Hillsong campus. Um, I keep telling Ravi I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I want it so we can get a Hillsong in Nashville. Anyway, I am just, um, I feel like I'm really indebted to y'all because my walk with Jesus is deeper because of the way he has been reflected to through you to me. So to get to be here is just, I mean, it is unbelievable. I love so many of your leaders. I would give Cass Langdon a kidney if she needed it. And so... <laughs> 
to get to be here this morning. It's just a huge privilege. Now, I do need to tell you something that happened um, at Color at ICC um, on Friday to set up where I wanna go before we go into God's word, and that is one of these beautiful Fijian, is it Fijian? Fijian, Pete? Okay, beautiful island women. Um, came up to me and she said, you should be from Fiji. And I was like, I should. And she said, yes, because you are so filled with joy and you jiggle. I was like, well, there you go. There you go. I thought I had it kind of kept in. You know, I tried not to stand next to Laura. I did my best to look like a, a slim one, but evidently I am the Fijian among you. And I tell you that story, I tell you, not that all Fijians are, are pudgy, it's just I'm a, a, a happy eating Fijian kind of a girl. <laughs> And, and I tell you that story because I filmed a Bible study recently and they, um, when they were just starting to shoot, um, realized when I put on my outfit, the producer looked at it, he said, Lisa, where are your Spanx? Um, do y'all know what Spanx are? Do you sell them in Australia? They're from the pit of hell. Um, they're basically, gentlemen, forgive me, y'all need to just look at Chelsea scores right now, but they're, they're I call them python panties. It's, it's just, it's kind of like a new fashion girdle. We're gonna get to the Bible in just a minute, just stay with me. <laughs> anyway, um, I was supposed to wear Spanx to keep everything in so people wouldn't be scarred by this video Bible study. And I had forgotten them and we were just about to go to camera so we didn't have time for somebody to run get any Spanx. And they were like, what are we gonna do? And I was like, I don't know because I had brought a shirt that I always think I'll lose like 40 pounds before the event in like a week and I hadn't. And so I brought a shirt in, in the belief that things were gonna change the next week. And the shirt was kind of geometric and, and rather snug. And so instead of a muffin top, I had kind of the whole bakery right here. And so the producer said, kind of their version of Kat said, of Kat, uh, Kat said the only thing we know to do is we've got gaffing tape. Um, you know, the camera guys, we've got gaffing tape. And they said, are you okay? Because if we don't tape you up, it's, it's gonna be distracting, the things that are poking out. And so I said, yes, all for the kingdom. And so I raised my arms, and from about here to here, they taped me with gaffing tape. And y'all, what's so hilarious is when I watched the playback, I was teaching on Hebrews, and I actually think some of the teaching is decent, but I had to talk in really short sentences. It was like, and then Jesus came and he, because I couldn't take breaths, because I was just taped all the way down. When they peeled that tape off, after the sting, it was like, oh, this is glorious. I felt kind of Fijian again. I was like, I am free. This is incredible. Bangers and mash, here I come. Y'all, I feel like as a cousin, because I'm totally claiming y'all as family, as a cousin in America, what I see from the cheap seats is that God has just started to unwind the duct tape from around Hillsong. I know amazing things have been done in the past 30 years. I feel like what's ahead is gonna be an explosion, a revival of such epic proportions. Y'all didn't know you could be that free. You didn't know there was that kind of efficacy coming. I really believe from the distance I'm watching this thing just kind of go, and I feel like the word God has given me to bring you, and I understand I'm a guest, so I understand that this is pretty presumptuous for me to bring basically the teacher a word, being the student, is fix your eyes on Jesus. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Do not tear your gaze away from Jesus. Those of you who were at Color know that I brought my daughter home from Haiti five years ago. I am single. My husband is lost, has not stopped to ask for directions, so if you know someone between 55 and death who's employed, I'm totally up for that, especially if he's an islander, but anyway, just throwing that out there in faith. Anyway, kind of like your hundredfold, Lee, whoever Lee is, I'm, I'm just trusting God's gonna bring me a Fijian man. Anyway, 
Um, I know, are there any, any, anyone? <laughs> anyway, I brought my little girl home from Haiti as a single mom five years ago. Um, the year I turned 50, I brought my little girl home from Haiti. She was four and a half years old. And my little girl, Missy, her first mama, Marie, died in Haiti of AIDS. And my little girl was really, really sick. She has HIV. At that point, she had tuberculosis and cholera. And the doctors in Haiti said she was only gonna live for two months. And so it was a pretty precarious health situation. Uh, by the time I got her to Nashville, she was getting better because I'd started her on antiretrovirals. And within three months, her health had stabilized. And so, praise Jesus, but a year after I had her home, she got sick. And for those of you who may know people who have um, compromised immune systems, it's a huge deal if a child with HIV gets the flu. With a normal kid, a high fever is no big deal, it'll break with Tylenol, but with a child with HIV, there's a possibility that that innocuous seeming flu will very quickly become pneumonia, and then oftentimes it leads to death in a child with a depressed immune system. So she was home for a year when she got sick the first time, and it scared me to death. I went to pick her up from school that morning when I dropped her off. She was all happy, energizer bunny. I came to pick her up six hours later, and Missy had just changed dramatically. She's kind of hunched over. It's like she could barely carry the weight of her backpack. Her face was chalky, which is a big deal when you have a beautiful brown kid, so much cuter than y'all's pale children. And she just, you know, her eyes were glassy. I know, I'm all up in it this morning, aren't I? But I could tell she was really sick, and so I brought her home, started doing what I know to do. I started pumping her full of fluids, gave her Tylenol, alternated with, with ibuprofen, and I took her temperature about two hours after I started this protocol, and it had actually spiked. She was at 102 degrees, which just scared me to death. And I thought, I'm just gonna bundle her in a blanket and take her to the ER. But first I called a dear friend of mine who's a surgeon and I said, Kathleen, because I live way out in the country. So I said, which hospital should I go to? Two hospitals about 30 minutes away. I said, which one will be able to see Missy the fastest? Which one do you think has the best pediatric, pediatric trauma? And she said, Lise, hang on just a second. Don't put her in the car just yet. She said, I'm talking to you as your friend and as a surgeon and as a mama. She said, let me ask you a couple of questions. She said, I want you to press the skin on Missy's arm and tell me if it springs back or if it stays depressed. And I said, no, it, it sprang back. And she goes, okay, that means she's not dehydrated. She said, is she going to the restroom? And I said, she, she is. I said, I'm having to carry her to the potty, but she is, she's going to the restroom. She said, okay, that's wonderful. She said, Lisa, here's the deal. After a few more questions, she said, um, I will gladly meet you at the hospital, but I can tell you almost assuredly, this is not a big deal. This has nothing to do with Missy's HIV. This is a very normal childhood fever, very normal. You keep doing exactly what you're doing with the fluids, alternated the Tylenol and the children's ibuprofen, and I bet you within two to three hours, Missy's fever will break. She said, and I'll still meet you at the hospital. You can call me every 15 minutes, but I can almost promise you this is no big deal. She said, now let me give you one warning. Because her fever is elevated, there is a chance Missy will talk out of almost delirium. She said, so if she wakes up and says something that seems like she's not completely coherent, don't panic. That too is very normal. Call me immediately, but don't panic. And so I got off the phone, I said, okay. I was trying to calm myself down. Maybe 15 minutes later, Missy wakes up and she leans forward in bed and goes, mama, I see Jeebus. I've been in vocational ministry for 30 plus years, um, have been to seminary twice, have a wall filled with commentaries in my home back in Nashville. Do you know how I responded when my five and a half year old said she saw Jesus? Run away from Jesus! Look away from Jesus, get away from Jesus, go away from Jesus, don't look at Jesus! Because y'all had read the books and seen like the podcast of when you go through a bright tunnel and you see the face of Christ, you're going to die. And I was like, no, 
no, look at Jason, get away from the light, get away from the light. And I was just panicked. I was like, I'm not ready for my little girl to go. Y'all, the message I feel like God is telling me to tell you is, don't look away from Jesus. You focus on Jesus. Her fever broke two hours later. We had breakfast two hours after that, sausage and biscuits, our version of bangers and mash. And I said, baby, we need to pray before we eat. And then I went, dear Jesus, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> I said, I am so sorry. I just counseled my own kid to look away from you. I know better than that. Y'all, sometimes when we're in crisis, sometimes when our emotions are skewed, it is very easy to get distracted by our circumstances and take our gaze off Jesus. The revival that God has begun at Kilsong, that God generated, will continue if you keep your eyes on Jesus. When you take your gaze off Jesus, you're gonna lose the momentum of what the Holy Spirit is stirring up. So my message to you this morning is really simple. Fix your eyes on Jesus and don't look away. Don't look away from Jesus. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter nine. I love the gospel of Mark. You know, it's actually the first gospel that was written, the first literary compilation of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. When they canonized scripture, fancy word for putting it in a list, they listed Matthew as the first gospel. But Mark is actually the first gospel chronologically, first written compilation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And I love this gospel account. And you will know this story even if you didn't bring your Bible. It's a, a very familiar story in the church. Mark chapter nine, beginning with verse two. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Mo and one for Elijah, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Now, if you've studied this part of Mark's gospel, you know that the mountain that they're talking about there, that's Mark, and then Peter narrated Mark's gospel, so it's Mark and Pete telling the story. That mountain is a mountain on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, where about 85% of Jesus' recorded miracles, the ones we read about in scripture, took place. A lot of scholars think it was Mount Hermon. Dr. Robert could probably tell us exactly which, but it was Mount Hermon or an adjacent mountain. And so Jesus and the three closest to him, Peter and James and John, hike up this mountain. They get to the top, and when they get to the top, shazam, <laughs> Jesus is transfigured. And he turns brilliant white. And then suddenly there appears on either side of Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Now y'all tell me what's wrong with the story. Y'all don't talk back, what's wrong with the story? <laughs> They've been dead for a long time. A really, really long time. Moses and Elijah, I mean, they have been stone cold dead for centuries and suddenly, shazam. There they are resurrected next to Jesus Christ who is illuminated. Has it bugged any of y'all that Moses didn't make into the promised land? Let's just be straight up, let's be family. Does that bug y'all? That is always stuck in my craw that Moses didn't make it into the promised land. Do y'all remember the story in the Old Testament? He's leading the Israelites, three million of God's people, they're a bunch of fussing ingrates, and he's leading them toward the promised land, and Moses gets ticked, and he hits a rock with a stick. I'm taking the tiniest bit of liberty with the Hebrew. Lee can fix it in, in, at Hillsong College. But he hits a rock with a stick, and God says, Moses, because of your anger, you don't get to go into the land of milk and honey. You are quarantined from Canaan. You're actually, you get married, buried here on Mount Nebo. You'll be able to see the land that the Israelites are gonna inherit, but Joshua is actually gonna lead them in. You get buried here on Mount Nebo. Y'all, that has always driven me nuts because I so identify with Moses. And I would have been much worse than Moses. 
You know, Moses was patient, he was kind, he was a great leader, and the people were such boogers. I mean, they were always, that's not a bad word in Australia, is it? Some of our words don't translate well here, and some of y'all's don't translate well there, so I was hoping I didn't just use an expletive. Anyway, they were, they were stinkers, they were rebellious, and all he did was hit a rock. I would have hit Israelites. I would have been like, boom, 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 boom. So I'm like, goodness, that seems kind of punitive. I mean, Moses was a good guy, despite the murder rap for the rest of the time. He was a really good guy, so for him not to make it in the promised land just seems, it seems harsh to me. Y'all, we tend to look at scripture through this very narrow grid of time and space. We forget that our God is not bound by time and space. There's no duct tape around our Redeemer. He is perfectly free to work outside of time and space. If we had a little interview this morning and Pastor Bobby was up here in one of those cool chairs from color and Mo was right over here and she starts interviewing Moses and she says, Moses, would you rather have gone into the promised land in your jar of clay, sweaty body, or would you rather the first time you set foot in a promised land, you're standing on top of Mount Hermon, you can see the entire Sea of Galilee, and you're standing next to a radiant redeemer, which would you choose? You know Moses would say, door number two, I could not have dreamed that big. Our stories are not limited by what we see, y'all. God operates outside of time and space. That's the first good news in this little first part of Mark chapter nine. The second bit of good news has to do with Peter's fear. They're on top of this glorious mountain. Jesus is radiant and Peter gets scared. Why do you think he was scared? Think about the Old Testament for just a second. Do you remember the last time a cloud came down and the voice of God came out of the cloud on top of a mountain? Do you remember it happened in Exodus? Right after they got out of captivity in Egypt, they get to Mount Sinai. You remember Moses hikes up and God comes down and he says, hey Moses, I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna reveal myself to my people in a theophany. That is a physical manifestation of God. It's gonna be in the form of a cloud. But this isn't a normal kind of cumulus cloud. This is a cloud containing all of my glory. So this is Shekinah. Only they weren't allowed to say Shekinah out loud. In Hebrew, that is, that's holy, y'all. Because Shekinah was the glory of God. So God says to Moses in Exodus, I'm gonna come down, but before I come down, y'all need to erect barriers around the base of the mountain. Because when my power comes down, it's gonna be so strong, so holy, that it will kill anybody who gets too close to it. So you've gotta erect a barricade. This is gonna be like an MC Hammer moment. Nobody can touch this. You've gotta stand back from the base of the mountain. Peter remembers that, y'all. He's a good Jewish boy. He has heard these stories. So he gets to the top of this mountain, Shazam, Jesus is glorified. He sees Moses and Elijah resurrected, and all of a sudden there's a cloud with the voice of God, and he's like, oh, crud. We are just about to die. We're not supposed to be up here. We can't get this close to God's glory, and suddenly the voice comes from the cloud, and you know what the voice says? Look at my son. Look at my son. You don't have to stand back anymore. This is the new covenant, son. I've sent Jesus and he has made a way for you to be reconciled with me. You don't have to stand back when my holiness comes down. You move toward me, you look at my son. Y'all, that's where we are, we're in the new covenant. It is glorious that we don't have to stand back from God. He is not a far away redeemer, he is an up close personal savior. And that's what God is saying to Peter and James and John, look at my son, gaze into his countenance. So you have this incredible revival that takes place on top of this Mount of Transfiguration. And do you know what happens next? Do you know what typically happens after revivals? There's a valley. There's a valley. There's a hard part after the pinnacle, and it happens next. Verse 14 of chapter nine. And when they came down, the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, 
What are you arguing about with them? I think that's one of the saddest questions in scripture because he's speaking to religious people and the question he asks them is, why are y'all fussing? Why are y'all disagreeing with each other? I see it happen all the time in the body of Christ. You know, it's not enough that we're attacked by the rest of the world, but Christians tend to shoot their wounded. Christians tend to, so- to side talk. Instead of going, I'm gonna gaze on Jesus, we get distracted by gossip. That's what's happening here. They're just cross-talking. Jesus goes, why are you arguing amongst yourselves? Why are you getting distracted by all these innuendos, all this gossip? He says, how long am I to be with you, O faithless generation? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me, because they've told him they're arguing over the fact that a father has brought his sick son to the disciples, and the disciples aren't able to heal him. So Jesus says, bring the boy to me. And they brought the boy to Jesus, and when the spirit saw him, verse 20, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell down on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his daddy, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. And it is often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, Jesus, have compassion on us and help us. His mama didn't even come this morning because she's so devastated by our son's sickness. Our whole family is just ripped up over this. We're scared to death that our boy isn't gonna make it. Jesus, if you can do anything, please help our family. And a son of God, he's just come off the Mount of Transfiguration to a bunch of fussing religious people who don't believe, who are distracted, and he says, if, if I can, if, have you so quickly forgotten that I was just glowing? If I can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Y'all, I think that's the holiest profession apart from what Jesus says in this passage. One of my favorite scholars, Tim Keller, says this. He says, it is helplessness, not holiness, that is the first step to connecting with God. It is helplessness, not holiness. I'm certainly not making light of sanctification. We are supposed to be growing in Christ's likeness, but we are never supposed to get apart from the cognizance of, I can't make it by myself. I believe, Jesus, I'm here twice a week at Hills, at the other campuses. I'm in, I'm all in, I'm studying my Bible, but I can't do this by myself. Helplessness, not holiness, is the first step to accessing God, I would say it's also the second step of continuing revival. Let us not be confused that we can carry this thing on. Our shoulders aren't wide enough, y'all. The revival God is generating at Hillsong is God generated and it will be carried by the Holy Spirit, not by us. If we take our gaze apart from Jesus, this whole thing is gonna go south. He says, you keep looking at me. The man confesses, I need help if I'm gonna keep looking at you. And when Jesus saw that a crowd had come running together, because crowds are drawn to noise, not necessarily because they trust in Christ, but they wanna see what all the drama is about. This is just for the women. Guys, y'all can completely ignore this. Difficulty is inevitable, y'all. It's inevitable. Jesus said that this world is broken, that you will have difficulty in this world. He said, I've come to overcome the world. Take cheer. He said, this world is difficult. Difficulty is inevitable. Drama is a choice. Girls, you hear that? Drama is a choice. Don't put on the duct tape. You stay free. Don't listen to the voices of other people telling you this isn't possible. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he is dead. Do you hear what they're saying? He's gone from bad to worse. 
He did just have a serious case of epilepsy, but now your boy's stone cold dead. Look what you did, dad. You got all fired up about Jesus and you hedged all of your bets into Jesus. You cashed in all your chips. You should have kept some out because what if this revival isn't really gonna work? What if this isn't really a miracle? What if this is just, I don't know, caffeine? Maybe you should have kind of, you know, kept a couple of chips back. I've heard essential oil is really good for healing epilepsy. You know, instead of focusing so much on Jesus, you could have rubbed him with some frankincense. Maybe you could have gone to another, another kind of a church. Good night, why did you put all your chips into Jesus? Because there's that gap between the spirit coming out of the boy and Jesus raising him up. We don't know how long it was. Could have been five minutes, could have been five hours. But in that gap between the boy looking as though he was dead and Jesus raising him up, obviously alive, there's a gap. And y'all, I'm telling you, there are always scoffers waiting on the curb, ready to speak death over revival. There will always be scoffers on the curb saying, really, really? Did that really happen at Color? Is that really happening at Hillsong? Are you sure? There will always be critics. We cannot get distracted by the critics. We've gotta keep our gaze on Christ. That's what this passage is all about. You fix your eyes on Jesus. I started the adoption process when I was 40. And I thought, I'm just gonna tell a few girls in my small group that I'm praying about adopting. I'm not sure if that's what I'm gonna do, but the Lord is just stirring my heart up and I need people to help me, carry me to the roof and lower me to Jesus so I can hear from the Lord. And so I thought, I'm not gonna tell a whole bunch of women because I know y'all don't do this in Oz, but in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live, sometimes women disguise gossip as prayer request. I thought, I'm just gonna tell a small group of women. And so I told four girls I was in a Bible study with, three basically said, Lisa, we've got your back. We'll pray with you and for you about whether this is what God has for you. One of them said, Lisa, if you've got time later on this week, I'd love to meet you for coffee and process this further. I went and I met that woman at a coffee shop. This is totally free. But if a really grumpy, unsmiling looking woman comes up to you with a quilted Bible cover and tells you she needs to meet you by yourself because she has a word for you from the Lord, y'all need to play dumb and take a friend. Just trust me on this. But I've never been the sharpest tool in the shed, so I met this woman by myself. And over coffee, she said, you know, Lisa, I just wanna be real straight with you because the Bible says the wounds of a friend are better than the kiss of an enemy. Here's the deal, y'all. Sometimes words of death can come from people who quote scripture. Sometimes words of death can come from believers. She said, I just wanna tell you, I think you have sabotaged the right to be a mother. She said, you have told our small group that there's sexual molestation in your backstory. And I know you've been to Christian counseling, but just in case you weren't fixed, you might unwittingly transfer some of the trauma you experienced as a child onto a child of your own. So she said, I know you wanna nurture. My advice to you is to go to the Nashville Humane Society and adopt a dog because you are really good with pets. And y'all, I should have known as a 40-year-old woman who walked an aisle in a church much like this, not quite as alive, but they love Jesus. I walked an aisle when I was five years old. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was five years old. My father had left our family and pastor was preaching that morning on how God is a father who doesn't turn his back on his children. And I walked an aisle because I wanted a daddy who wouldn't leave. So as a 40 year old woman, I'd spent 35 years walking with Jesus. Don't you look at that mama. I told them in the last service, if you give it a dirty look toward a mama or a daddy with a new baby, I'll pray you get hives. That is the sound of glory. That's revival right there in church. Thank you for bringing your baby to church. That thrills me, makes me wanna have another one somehow. Anyway, it'd be a little bit of Sarah action if that happened. Um, I should have known as a 40-year-old Christ follower that this woman speaking those words of death over me, it, she was a crooked little tree. Somewhere in her backstory, she'd experienced such a, a drought or such a serious storm that it bent her trunk and she wasn't bearing good fruit. What was falling out of her mouth was not congruent with what is in God's word. 
because Jesus does not use shame as a motivational tool. But here's the deal. The enemy doesn't distract us with things that we obviously recognize. He usually distracts us with lies that are woven with just enough truth that we'll swallow it because it smells familiar. And so as a 40-year-old woman, you know what I did? I took the adoption application, I had printed out, I put it in the very back of my file drawer at church where I worked. And then the next afternoon, I went to the Nashville Humane Society and I adopted a chocolate lab named Sally with bladder control problems. <laughs> and she was a sweet dog, a little dribbly, but sweet. She was not God's will for me that season. Y'all, I got distracted. I got distracted when somebody said, are you sure? I went, no, no, I'm not sure. I took my eyes off Jesus. At the end of the story, the disciples say to Jesus, how come we couldn't heal the boy? How come we couldn't help this family? And you know what he says to him? You forgot to pray. You forgot to pray. You forgot that your power has always been from me. You can't do a single thing by yourself. If you quit looking at me, you will lose all power, all efficacy. You will not change the world around you. You have got to fix your eyes on me. Y'all, that is the message God is bringing. No song. It's the message. Jade, y'all can come up with the band. We're gonna have a, a different kind of response. I'm gonna ask the band to go ahead and come up. And, and I wanna just have a time where y'all go ahead and stand if you're physically able. And I think it is prudent. I think it's right for us as a church that's right at the beginning of revival. You're in the first chapter of a new season, an incredible new season. God is stirring. God is beginning to bring about phenomenal things at Hillsong. And y'all, now would be the time that it would be so easy to get distracted. They had just come down the Mount of Transfiguration. They forgot his glory. It is so easy to take our eyes off Jesus. It was seven more years before I started the adoption process. Seven lost years. You don't want to lose a day of what God is doing at Hillsong this season. You don't want to lose a week. You certainly don't want to lose seven years of what God is stirring. So I believe what he's calling for in us is the posture that this daddy exhibits in Mark 9. Jesus, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Where there is any place in my heart that I don't believe in what you're doing right now, would you circumcise it? Jesus, I believe, please forgive me for the places I've been flippant. Please forgive me for the places I have gossiped about the leaders in our church. Please forgive me for the places where I'm not totally focused on you and I've looked to the right or to the left. If God right now is stirring in you the posture of confession and if he's not, somebody needs to punch you in the throat because we are always supposed to be in the posture of confession. We are always supposed to be cognizant of the fact that I can't make it by myself. I can't make it by myself. Jesus, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Would you, if you were if it's possible where you are, would you get on your knees, especially those of you under 30? If you're over 30, you get a pass. But if you're under 30, get on your knees and we're gonna have a time of worship. And as we worship, would you just cry out as a family, Lord, we believe but help us in our unbelief. Put your hands on the side of our face. Turn our attention back fully towards you. Jesus, have your way in this revival. Jesus, carry this revival. Jesus, keep my heart tender. Jesus, keep my mouth holy. Jesus, have your way in me. Fix my gaze on you, the author and the perfecter of my faith. Help me to not be distracted. Jesus, may it be so. Here I stay, I surrender. You love my 
it's no accident you're here this morning it doesn't matter how you came to be here the truth is and the reality is that God loves you and God knows you and God has an incredible plan and purpose for your life God sees you my friend the Bible says that in a right relationship with God you can know forgiveness for your past meaning for your today and a hope for your future but to become right in our relationship with God or to get right that doesn't come through religious observation it doesn't come through trying to observe rules it doesn't come through trying to be a better person it comes through being right in our relationship with God's Son the Lord Jesus Christ because it's Jesus that connects us to God and it's Jesus that connects us to God's grace and I'd like to pray right now specifically for two groups of people the first of those who are here and you've never made a conscious decision to surrender ownership of your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and the second of those who are here and at some point in the past you've done that but you're a long way from God could I ask for every eye to be closed and every head to be bowed and every Christian to be passionately but quietly praying for those two groups of people and if you say Grant when you count to three in just a moment and you pray a prayer that is all about people giving ownership of their lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ I want to be included in that prayer I want to make that decision then simply right where you're standing I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge it and we'll include you in that prayer I don't want to embarrass anybody I just want to know who I'm praying for you ready Christians are praying one two three lift your hand if you would say include me in that prayer I want to surrender ownership of my life over to the Lord Jesus Christ I want to get my my life right with God lift your hand if you say include me in that prayer I am making a decision for Jesus thank you God bless you hands being raised thank you God bless you I can see hands being raised Christians are praying people are getting their life right with God thank you hands being raised God bless you God bless you fantastic God bless you fantastic beautiful 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 you know what put your hand down if you raise your hand you raise it for a reason and really it's about you surrendering ownership of your life over to Jesus and I'm gonna ask you to pray a prayer out loud with me but we're all going to pray as a big family I'm gonna ask everybody to repeat this prayer out loud after me but if you raise your hand just pray this prayer out of your heart to God and I believe he's gonna meet you right where you're at dear Heavenly Father I surrender surrender. ownership of my life life. to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And I thank you you that through Jesus, Jesus, I can know forgiveness for my past, past. 
meaning for my today, a hope for my future, and I commit to live my life for you. Amen. Can we thank God for people making that decision? I think just about the best decision you can make is to give ownership of your life over to Jesus. And uh, hopefully uh, one of our team would have seen you or on the way out in the foyer out there on the, uh, any of our foyer exits, we will have team and we wanna give you a gift. And it's this Bible, it's on behalf of our church. And I pray you would just walk up, just take this Bible, we wanna give it to you. And uh, it's a memento of the decision you've just made. But could I encourage you if you've made that decision, two simple things. Number one, take the Bible home and start to read it. And what you'll find is God will speak to you and you'll be able to grow in your relationship with God and then make a decision. Second thing is make a decision that you're gonna come back to church and come to church regularly where you can meet people and find friends and you can grow in friendship. People who would love Jesus and they can be your friend as well and you can grow in the Word and you can grow in community. It's a really healthy thing. Can we thank God one more time for people making that decision? Stay here, stay here with me. Amen, that's so exciting when that happens. In a moment, Grant's going to attend to something, but I just want to, where did she go? Oh, come back. Just come back. Yeah, be still. Just stay there. Um, I don't often do this, but um, I love you, and I feel the Spirit of God wants you to know more than you ever know how much you are loved of Him, adored of Him, and how precious you are. And you're in a season of you're in a season of deep study. You're a smart cooker. You self-efface all the time. It's part of your delightful personality and humor and gift. But you're a deep you're a deep girl, and you're in a season of deep study. And you're committed to that, and you've made sacrifices for that. And I really believe that you're a gift on this earth. I feel the spirit of God would say, Lisa, you're actually a treasure on the earth because you delve deep into the things of God, you go into the deep places of God and you bring it it out like treasure and you make it so tangible and so doable with the gift and the personality and the hilarity and the wonder that is upon you. And I feel I want the Spirit, the Spirit of God saying you're a treasure in the earth. Many years ago, a man of God came to our land, Pastor Tommy Barnett, and he prophesied and he spoke over our church, Hillsong Conference, a lot of years ago in a stadium downtown. And he said, you're a national treasure, Hillsong. And this nation doesn't recognise it, but you're a national treasure. And it was so humbling and so beautiful. But I believe the Spirit of God would say that to you. And He loves your sacrifice. And He's gonna bless you. And we're gonna bless you as a church. We're gonna put our hand towards you right now. Come on, family. We're gonna pray. Father, I thank You for this beautiful woman, Your daughter. And Lord Jesus, I ask that You will overshadow her with Your Spirit and Your grace and Your kindness and Your provision that she will not need to labour for the things that are the promise of God on her life. Father God, we ask that You will bless her and Missy and their family. That Father God, what You have purposed in her, even in these years, in this season, Father God, that Lord, You will blow upon it because surely Your eyes are upon the Lord and He loves You, Lisa. He loves You with all His heart and all His soul and all His strength. In Jesus' Name, in Jesus' Name, Amen. 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 Oh, beautiful. You can be seated. You know, uh, Lisa, obviously she speaks and she travels and uh, we want to bless her ministry. So we're going to receive an offering, a love offering, just to give directly into her ministry. It's a completely free will offering. Uh, but if you want to give into that, uh, you can do that. I would encourage you to do that if you're able to. And you can use the envelopes that are on the on the seats or you can uh, give via the app I gave in the 9 a.m. service just via the app. But we'll take a moment and our hosts uh, will come and uh, pass the containers. And just while you're preparing tonight, Sunday nights have been amazing. And uh, there's been a, a genuine revival spirit. And tonight, Pastor Brian's gonna be leading the services and he's gonna be believing for prophecy and to be moving in the, uh, in the Holy Spirit. And uh, so it'd be great if you can be here. And also we have blessed because Brooke Fazer and Joel Houston are gonna be leading with our team, our worship team. So that's gonna be, it's gonna be good. Um, I mean, they're part of our church, but it's great to have them leading here at Hills. They're not often here together. So uh, church tonight is gonna be great. If our host can begin to receive that giving, that'd be awesome. Who here, uh, 
just needs prayer for healing. I mean, you could have a cold, you could have woken up with the flu, or you could have something far more serious. Just while you're seated, just, just raise your hand. Just so I know who I'm praying for. Lord, you see every hand. And Lord, you know every circumstance. And we just believe for healing to be your people's portion, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you that we don't have to strive for it. It's by your grace. But Lord, I believe for healing, healing on your people, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Carl just came and told me that Chris Kane is going to be here and speaking as well tonight. So that's going to be awesome. So, I mean, what a night in church. What a night in church. You wouldn't want to miss it. I think our hosts are just awesome. And they volunteer their time to help build church. If the containers have passed you by, you can stand up. Can we thank Lisa Harper one more time for a beautiful, beautiful word? And Lord, I thank you that you bless your people and you keep your people. You cause your face to shine upon them. Lord, we walk this week out with our heads held high and our shoulders back because of Your grace and Your kindness. I speak Your favour over Your people. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Be blessed. We love you. See you tonight. Come on, church. Why don't you clap your hands with us this morning? Staring into Your eyes makes my heart Suddenly brought to life back to you And reaching beyond the skies Running deep, stretch your mind Perfect love realized here with you This love is for real, you will never let go Revival.